had already been a month at Rome. Time was passing, and we did not move. My patience was almost exhausted, but his eminence was assailed with doubts and scruples. I was obliged to submit. To beguile the tedious hours, I tried to visit the soil which I was treading and which had been trodden by the masters of the world. Here the Gracchi had perished, there Scipio, further on Servilius. Wherever I turned my eyes, they fell in some spot polluted by crime or bloodshed. It was quite enough for me, and I had no need of the recollections awakened by the aspect of the ruins of Flaminius had once inhabited to estimate the value of an aristocracy. At length, I received Dr. O'Meara's report of the Emperor's complaint. It was as follows. In the last days of September, symptoms have been developed which indicate a disordered state of the hepatic regions. Napoleon had before that time had frequent attacks of catarrh, headache, and rheumatism, but these affections are now aggravated. His legs and feet are swollen. The gums have assumed a spongy, scarbutic appearance, and signs of indigestion have become manifest. 1st October 1817, acute pain, heat, sensation of heaviness in the right hypochondriac region accompanied by dyspepsia and costiveness. From that period, the disease has continually increased. Its progress has been slow, but in ceasing, the pain, which at first was slight, has become so violent that an inflammatory hepatitis may be feared. This aggravation of the disorder proceeds from a violent catarr. Three of the molar teeth were carious, and I thought they might be in part the cause of the inflammatory affections of the maxillary muscles and membranes, and that they might also have produced the catarr. I therefore extracted them at proper intervals, and the attacks have since been less frequent. In order to remove the scorbutic appearance of the gums, I prescribed a vegetable diet and the use of acids. The treatment had the desired effect. The affection disappeared, returned again, and again yielded to it. Opening medicines and frictions had relieved the legs. They were, however, again attacked after some time, but less violently. Purgatives, warm baths, abundant perspirations have often diminished the pain in the hypochondriac region without however dissipating it completely in the months of april and may it increased considerably became irregular and produced costiveness diarrhea abundant evacuations of bilious and mucous matter accompanied with loss of appetite sensations of heaviness uneasiness and depression at the pit of the stomach, face pale, sclerotic, tunical of the eye, yellow. The patient could not lean on the left side. He experienced heat in the right hypochondriac region, nausea, sometimes followed by vomiting, acrid and viscous, and increased with pain, almost total absence of sleep, extreme weak, weakness. The swelling of the legs again appeared, but in a less degree than the first, headache, uneasiness, anxiety, oppression in the epigastric and precordial region, paroxysm of fever in the earlier part of the night, skin hot, thirst, nausea, pulse quick towards day calm and perspiration. This is an effect that may be generally observed in the case of the patient. The fever leaves him after an abundant perspiration. There is in the right hypochondriac region a tumefaction, which is felt on exterior pressure. The tongue is almost constantly white. The pulse, which before his illness gave 54 to 60 pulsations per minute, now beats at 88. Pain above the shoulder blade ordered two purgatives to stimulate the liver and the bowels and to reestablish the secretion of the bile. This gave relief, but it was of short duration. In the last days of May, and the first days of June, the effects produced were slight and momentary, proposed the use of mercury, but the patient manifested the greatest repugnance to take it and objected to it under any shape. I advised him to ride on horseback, to rub every day the hypochondriac regions with a brush, to wear flannel, to take warm baths, to use remedies, to seek diversion, to follow a diet, and not to expose himself to bad weather. 
and to the variation of the atmosphere, he has neglected the two most important things, exercise and diversion. At last, on the 11th of June, I overcame his repugnance and obtained that he would try mercury, and he took mercurial pills. He continued this medicine until the 16th. I administered them night and morning and gave him now and then some opening medicines to remove costiveness. At the end of six days, I changed the prescription and substituted calomel for mercury, but it produced nausea, vomiting, and colic, and a general sensation of uneasiness. I suspended the use of it and tried it again on the 19th. It caused the same effects. I returned to the first mercurial preparation and gave it three times a day until the 27th when I discontinued it altogether. The Apartments were extremely damp, and Napoleon had a violent catarrh with high fever and extreme irritation. I again had recourse to the former remedy on the 2nd of July and continued it till the 9th, but without success. The salivary glands were still in the same state. Absence of sleep, irritation, and vertigos were of more frequent occurrence. Two years of inaction, a murderous climate, apartments low and ill-ventilated, a most barbarous treatment, solitude, every circumstance that can painfully affect the mind has concurred in this case, and all combined have acted with simultaneous effect on the patient. Can it be a matter of surprise if the hepatic regions are disordered? Is it not, on the contrary, wonderful that the progress of the malady has not been more rapid, that it has not must be attributed to the strength of mind of the patient and to the soundness of a constitution unimpaired? by intemperance or debauchery. Very Eomira, Longwood, 9th of July, 1818. The Cardinal and Madame Mayor wished to lay this report before some members of the profession at Rome, and for that purpose they assembled a consultation of those who enjoyed the greatest reputation. I was present at the conference together with one of the missionaries, but without taking part in the deliberations, the result of the consultation was delivered to me a few days after in writing that document was to be my law, my guide. I was not to deviate from it. A copy of it? Sixth, lastly, in the hottest time of the year, cold or at least slightly tepid baths as well as shower baths on the right hypochondriac regions may be resorted to, but with prudence, if the continuation or increase of the obstruction in the liver should require it, the scorbutic affection should not forbid their use. The applicability of the advice contained in this consultation must depend on the peculiar circumstances of the case of the August patient and on the state of his disorder when the medical attendant selected for him shall visit him. Paul Baptiste Mucciali. Rome, 1st of February, 1819. In the midst of all these consultations, cares, and anxieties, time was rapidly passing away. The end of February re- approached, and the period of our departure was not yet fixed. It was in vain that I begged and prayed. His eminence had always still some case to provide for, some arrangements to make, and my solicitations produced no effect. At last, however, by dint of perseverance, I succeeded. He yielded and gave the desired order, but we were still obliged to lose two days in order to accept a most magnificent dinner at which Madame Mare, Pauline, and Louis were present. Everybody was in very good spirits, and they all wished us a pleasant journey and a safe passage. We had numberless ornaments for the emperor's chapel, but not a single letter, not a word for the emperor himself. His eminence had been so much engaged with bulls and symbols and other matters of faith that he had not had the time to announce our departure or even to write a few lines of introduction for us to the grand marshal. He, however, promised to send the London dispatches for St. Helena and on the 25th in the morning. We at last quitted Rome, but unfortunately, our horses were not good and the roads were bad so that we proceeded but slowly, and were twelve days going to Bologna. Her Majesty, the Archduchess Maria Louisa, had arrived there the day before us. She was going to Florence, whither she was to proceed to her August father. She did not stop, but the inhabitants had run to meet her, and taking the horses from her carriage, had drawn her a considerable distance in the midst 
of the most lively acclamations, we continued our journey and reached successively Modena and Parma at the latter place. We got a lock of little Napoleon's hair, which we religiously carried to St. Helena. We passed through Turin, over Mount Sini, through Geneva, part of Switzerland, the Duchy of Baden, along the right bank of the Rhine, and reached Frankfurt on the 1st of April. In that city, I had been directed to see the Countess of Servilliers. Joseph's wife, who received me in the most flattering manner and inquired very particularly respecting the health of Madame Mare. She also introduced me to her two daughters, whose beauty was only equaled by their modesty, and asked me several questions concerning the eldest son of Prince Canino, Lucian, being ignorant of the marriage that was then projected. I was at a loss to account for the lively interest he inspired. I went the following day to Offenbach, where countless causes resided. Abbe Bonavita had a letter for him from his eminence, and I wished to offer my services to him and take his commands for St. Helena. But we found him so ill and so exhausted that he could scarcely make himself heard. He entered into some details respecting his complaint and asked my advice as to what he was to do. And this discussion and the information he gave us about St. Helena made it very late when I returned to Frankfurt. However, as we were to set off the next morning, I went to take leave of Madame de Servilier. She again asked me several questions, appeared satisfied with my answers, and expressed a wish to see the introduction to the great anatomical work of Mascagni of which I had a copy with me. The subject was not one much calculated to flatter the delicate taste of a lady, but she desired it and I obeyed. She admired the neatness and beauty of the execution of the work and was pleased to address me some highly flattering encomiums on the subject. She then requested me to remember her to the emperor and delivered to Abbe Bonavita various trifling things, some of which were for his majesty and the others for Madame Bertrand. On leaving Frankfurt, we proceeded through Antwerp to Ostend, where we embarked on board the packet. Our destination was known, and we received marked attention from everybody on board. Some addressed congratulations to us, others expressions of regret, all save one seemed as if they would willingly have shared our exile. What madness, exclaimed he, bought apart a traitor. I was going to reply to the exclamations of this Englishman who continued them in a tone participating of anger and shame. Let him alone, said somebody. It is Campbell. He has some right to be abusive. Do not interrupt him. I followed this advice. Our captain was in high spirits. His pleasantry entertained us all, and we all agreed with him to Napoleon's shame that to set an old woman after a man at a ball was to play him a scandalous trick and laugh at him in the most cruel manner. But however much we might approve our captain's resentment, we were unwilling that he should carry it too far. We told him so. He was going to be angry, but we begged he would not, and he listened to us. We soon got to Dover and afterwards to London, where we arrived on the 19th. Two days after our arrival, we called at Lord Bathurst's office. We were desirous of delivering to his lordship the letter from the cardinal, announcing to him the departure of our little colony for St. Helena. But his lordship did not condescend to receive us. He sent us a secretary who asked us some questions relative to our departure, our arrival, and the incidents of our journey, and promised to lay our dispatches before his lordship and to send us an answer very shortly. Accordingly, a few days afterwards, Abbe Bonavita received a letter informing us that we were to hold ourselves in readiness to set off and that we should proceed to the Cape in the first instance, there being no opportunity direct for St. Helena. Vignali could not go with us. We were told at the same time, one priest being sufficient for Bonaparte and the cardinal having received permission for four persons only. This determination was very unwelcome and upset all the calculations of his eminence, but fortunately, our apostolical prefect succeeded in obtaining its revocation. He wrote to Lord Bathurst, representing his age and infirmities, and the orders of his holiness, the Pope, forbidding all missionaries to go singly into a country that is not Catholic. The minister relented, gave some hopes to the old man, and granted at least to his gray hairs what he had refused to the cardinal. 
Nothing now remained but to set off, but the winds were contrary. There were no opportunities for St. Helena, and the ships for the Cape had already sailed. We must wait until after the weather became favorable, and we should be sent out by the first transport that sailed. Such was the language held to us. Opportunities for those places occurred frequently. We knew it. But on every occasion, the minister had received no intelligence of it, and it would have ill become us to be better formed than the government. Dr. O'Meara had just arrived in London. I immediately went to him to obtain some details respecting the emperor's situation. He told me that it was daily growing worse, that hepatitis is endemic at St. Helena, that all his cares, all the most famed remedies had failed to arrest its progress, and that he considered Napoleon's cure impossible unless he were to be removed from the fatal influence of that climate. At his departure, he had advised him to call in Dr. Stokoe of the Conqueror, but this gentleman had scarcely paid a few visits. When the governor had taken umbrage at it, Dr. O'Meara delivered to me Dr. Stokoe's reports, which were in the following tenor, Longwood, 17th, January, 18. 18- 19. I have visited Napoleon this morning and found him in a state of extreme weakness. He suffered great pain in the right side, in the hepatic reason, and shooting pains in the shoulder. In the middle of the night, he had a violent headache followed by vertigos, which lasted a quarter of an hour. After it was over, he took a warm bath, which brought on abundant perspiration and gave him considerable relief.